There's so much to investigate about how music moves us, how black music specifically moves us, how it heals us. And it's this force that has existed at the bedrock of American popular culture and has been a clear driving engine for black resilience, for black flourishing for centuries. And yet, when you look at the scientific literature about it as a force for healing, it's so thin. Music is pure magic, and I think we haven't even started to really scratch the surface. The sheer underrepresentation of Black musical art forms within clinical research, um, that, for me alone, sheds light on how deeply underinvestigated music is as a healing force. There's just these wide open domains of investigation. Welcome to Mind and Life. I'm Wendy Hasenkamp. Today I'm speaking with musician, researcher, and activist Grant Jones. Grant is currently working on his PhD in clinical psychology at Harvard University, where he's creating contemplative and liberatory tools for underserved populations. He's also the co-founder of the Black Lotus Collective, a meditation community that centers healing for people with historically marginalized identities. I spoke with Grant last spring, and in our conversation, he shares about his deep love for both music and meditation, and how he's working to synthesize those two modalities for healing. We talk about his collaborations with Esperanza Spalding, Lama Rod Owens, and others, and the music-based contemplative intervention he's developed to help heal race-based anxiety. Grant also does some fascinating research on psychedelics, we get into that too, specifically around blind spots related to our current understanding of the benefits of psychedelics and how race and ethnicity play into that picture. When I step back from Grant's work, I see a thread of transcendence, of moving beyond the small self, and at the same time, holding the identities that we have in this time and place and working within them to address trauma, injustice, and inequity. And through it all, as you'll hear, Grant has a lightness and a joy that shines in its own kind of healing. You can learn more about Grant's work, hear some of his music, and find his intervention in the show notes. All right, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I love what Grant is doing in the world. It's a pleasure to share with you, Grant Jones. I'm so happy to be joined today by Grant Jones. Grant, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I'm really curious for you, your path into integrating not only contemplation and research, but also music and activism and all the other things that you do. So however you want to take that, uh, we'd just love to hear a little bit of background. Yeah. 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 We only have an hour, so I'll try to (laughs) to keep it short. Um, My research is unapologetically personal. Um, I think for me, the desire to blend all those domains just comes for me an iterative process of trying to figure out how do I keep all of the elements of my life that I hold dear? Um, how do I keep contemplative practice close while still trying to navigate this world and take care of myself and feel joy? Um, and for me, it's it's led me to research. It's led me to wanting to figure out how do I use music as a vehicle for supporting communities, supporting people who are like me. How do I uh, use these practices that have been so fundamental to, um, yeah, to make me feel grounded, to make me feel whole, to make me feel safe in this world? Um, yeah, that exploration has has led me to the work that I do now. How did you um, become interested in contemplative practice? Yeah, so I think my, my journey with contemplative practice started very explicitly when I was a wee lad of 18, um, uh-huh. when I was, a, I was a freshman at Harvard um, first year. And for me, I think being at a place that was so um, overwhelming, Harvard was so overwhelming uh, <laughs> to, to, to go to for the first time. I was, you know, this kid um, from the inner city of Boston who had gone to private school for a long time, but Harvard was a whole nother level of just stress, competition, um, imposter syndrome. And I got to a place, you know, in my work in which I was just, I was experiencing so much anxiety that it really became difficult to navigate schoolwork in a way that felt easeful. And so I think for me, it it very naturally led me to just have to shut my laptop, put the work down and just take a few deep breaths. And for me, that process was so 
immediately powerful mm. that it kind of let me down this rabbit hole of realizing that I had this agency over my inner experience. I had the ability to bring myself back into touch with myself. And for me, the implications of even just those few initial breaths of getting grounded really set me down a path of, of developing a daily practice of this. And I really haven't been able to stop since and it's since taken over my life in the best way. So, And then uh, a lot of your work focuses on music as well. Mm -hmm. So when did that come in? Was that always an interest of yours? or? Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, music, I would say, before anything else, was is was my first spiritual practice. I mean, mm -hmm. music was such a core part of um, what it has meant for me to be alive, to make sense of reality, make sense of the world. And so I think for me, there's always been a desire to figure out how do I put music first. And I think in this world, we're given very few models besides, you know, becoming a very famous pop star <laughs> around how to how to keep music central. Um, and so I think for me, again, I've just had to get really creative about, like, what does it mean for me to build a life centered around music at the same time as I navigate capitalism, try to feed myself, try to make a living in the world. And I think it, that's also been another a core driver for me of... Um, again, rooted in an in inherent way, thinking about, okay, if music is a spiritual practice for me, and I know just for so many other black folks, it's the thing that gets us through. It's like, okay, if I know that, I know this more deeply than I know anything, um, that this force is such a healing force, is such a grounding force. You know, I'm in this PhD. Um, I like meditation. For me, like one question led to another, thinking about this as, you know, as a vehicle for healing, for contemplation, also, you know, using the platform that I have within the academy to, to really rigorously test and investigate that. Well, yeah, let's jump in a little bit to your work. Do you want to share some of your research around sure. music and mindfulness? And yeah. yeah, it would be an honor. Yeah, I, I, you also catch me like deep in the middle of a grant writing season around it. So what I'm describing right now is also um, coming to be my dissertation is also going to be the work that I you know hope to continue to do for as much time as I have on this planet. But throughout the course of my time in graduate school, um, my work has uh, surrounded developing a music-based mindfulness intervention in the form of an album that combines um, originally composed music that I made um, and also have made with some collaborators, guided meditations that I've also worked with some collaborators to make, and then um, poetry, all of which centers the Black American experience and is meant to just provide um, grounding, centering, and also just an understanding that, you know, there's folks out there who are just going through similar things to you who are trying to heal um, straight up. And this intervention exists with the main aim of trying to reduce race-based anxiety, so anxiety that stems from experiences of racism and discrimination um, in the black community. And throughout my time in grad school, like I said, I've been um, developing it and testing it. And I've just conducted the first two pilot studies, um, which is really exciting. Um, some really promising preliminary results from those. Um, so right now, yeah, I'm writing grants to, to further develop the intervention and test it more rigorously um, in some uh, randomized controlled trials. That's it in a, at a high level, and there's definitely a lot more details that I would love to share. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, what kinds of outcomes are you looking at? So the main outcome that I'm looking at um, is race-based anxiety. And I'm also, in the second pilot test that I did, I also started to do um, some preliminary investigations of mechanisms. So there's this album that exists that I, that I made, um, that's ostensibly a uh, music-based mindfulness intervention. So mindfulness is the core driver, but I also needed to do investigations to actually understand that is the case, that it's actually moving mindfulness um, as, a, as, um, as a potential um, mechanism. So I've also investigated its um, ability to increase mindfulness and self-compassion um, as well. So race-based anxiety, mindfulness, and self-compassion have been the, the core domains that I've explored and also in the future hope to assess um, its ability to support with racial trauma um, and other forms of suffering mm. generally. And was this being developed in like 2020 around pandemic and when George Floyd yes. was killed? Yeah, you totally nailed that. I mean, that actually was the the time in which a lot of this idea was born. I mean, George Floyd's death and the uprisings were so inextricably linked to my calling into this work um, and just what it meant for me to try to think about my contribution to wellness for black folks. And so um, this this work definitely started um, in earnest around then. And like with many things in research, it's, you know, taken and taking years to really see it through and see it um, into actualization. But um, have been a lot of exciting developments since then. But yeah, 2020 was such a huge part of my coming to be in this work for sure. Mm, yeah. And um, 
I want to hear more about the intervention itself and how you kind of blend the music and the mindfulness. So maybe can you share a little about that? So yeah, I go about this in a few different ways. Um, so like I said, I think the first thing for me is um, just comes from a very personal place. A lot of the music that exists on this intervention has unabashedly served to support me through my own practice is kind of my own personal brand of dharma um, and my understanding of what does it mean to find presence, find peace, to wish myself wellness, to wish myself happiness, um, realizing that, you know, my wellness is inextricably tied with everybody else's, um, particularly the wellness of other black folks. For me, again, the intervention primarily just, getting, again, flows from a personal place. Um, that's that's first and foremost. Second, I also, beyond the personal, feel grateful to be in collaboration with a lot of folks with really special and very deep dharmic and spiritual practice and meditation practices of their own. So the meditations um, on the intervention are drafted and co-written um, by Lama Rod Owens, um, mm. who's you know such a, a powerful being and such a leader within um, the meditation world um, at present. So and he also delivered the interventions as well. So he he's featured on the on the offering, which is called Healing Attempt. By the way, I don't think I've said its name explicitly, but the intervention in the album is called Healing Attempt. So not only has he contributed guided meditations to um, the intervention, but then he's also reviewed the music that I have on it. Um, and just like I'm just like, hey, is this is this good? Because obviously I have my own personal practice, but I also again I think accountability is super important. Like maybe you know my practice taking me someplace that really might not resonate with some folks. So so definitely. Again, I'm glad to be held accountable. And Lama Rod and I um, met each other in 2016 and worked together in Boston for a number of years to hold meditation uh, space and community for folks of color. So we also have a really tender and beautiful relationship with with him. And so glad to be held um, in accountability by him. And also, um, yeah, just his presence in this work is just so um, sacred. And so that that's number two. Number three, I would say about how I think about infusing meditation into the work is, like I said, with empirics, I think that's the third domain. So actually testing it, um, some of the measures that I've um, tested have been, you know, a composite measure of mindfulness and self-compassion to, um, so that I have, you know, clear empirical backing that the intervention can potentially move those targets. Again, nothing definitive because very small sample sizes that I've used um, have just run this, um, these tests with 13 people total, um, but have a clear preliminary signal of, um, of efficacy and that this might work, which again, hopefully, if any funders are listening, will open me up to, <laughs> to being resourced um, for more rigorous tests, deeper tests of the intervention. Um, and then fourth, I also ask folks, I'm like, hey, is this helpful for you? Like, does this help you get grounded? That was also a core part of my work of this research is um, just asking people, like, do you like this? Would you recommend this to people? Does this help your anxiety? Uh, does this help you get grounded? Um, how can we improve this? So just, again, just having having that dialogue as well. And again, blessed to say that, you know, the preliminary um, results of some of those open-ended questions have been very affirming with the approach. And so that's been, um, yeah, another domain um, as well. And then there's other collaborators who, like I said, who have come with their own um, personal practices that that I also trust a lot. Well, I'm happy to talk a bit about because um, that's frankly like an extremely exciting part of this work for me too. So, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So um, I think the second collaborator that I'll name because his um, poetry is currently included in the intervention. His name is Terry Edmonds, and he is again just another profound um, being, um, a very special man. He. Um, was the chief speechwriter for President Clinton. Um, so he's a really, again, just has deep expertise with using words to like truly shape the entire consciousness of, of America, which is really special. Um, and he's also a poet. And so he, and a lot of his poetry is about belonging, healing, self-arrival within the Black experience. And so he contributed two poems to the intervention. Um, yeah, and just, again, just so much tenderness for, for him and so much appreciation. And then so the final collaboration they're working on right now is, again, just uh, of particular uh, meaningfulness to me just because this is um, actually a lifelong hero of mine and also um, become, a, you know, a dear, a dear mentor as well. Uh, so the final collaborator that we are currently in the process of working on a track to be included um, is Esperanza Spalding, who's mm. a really, really established, um, renowned um, musician who, again, is just amazing. Uh, yeah, who's just a personal hero. So and is still a mentor in some of this work in some of the early stages and has now become a collaborator. So we're working on a song that's going to be included in the intervention. And just, again, circle back to the question about how we center meditation um, in this work is, again, we both have, you know, our own uh, deep meditation practices. But the beauty of doing 
this work iteratively is that given that I get feedback from the participants about this work, we can take that feedback and we took the feedback and then used it to create this song. So it's directly data informed um, based on what has been um, helpful, what people wanted to address to further support the meditation practices and anxiety reduction um, in the past. So it's again, it feels like a very sacred, special thing um, and can't wait for it to be out and to be done. Will this be um, available publicly or? Is yeah, no, thanks for asking. Again, critical question, something that I've been meaning to say. This intervention is designed specifically to go on um, music streaming platforms. And so the the idea is that it will be released on Spotify. Awesome. Um, yeah, and then, and then we'll continue to test uh, Spotify and other music streaming platforms as a form of, um, yeah, of dissemination of the intervention as well. Um, I'm hoping that I can, you know, get enough resourcing to launch this work in earnest on major streaming platforms by next year because most of the music is done. It's just I'm really working on two last things, the track with Esperanza and then Lama Ra is going to contribute uh, one final meditation. He's contributed two th thus far and then has a third on the way. So after those are done, I'm really just trying to get it out because I've been sitting on so much music for so long and it's, I feel ready to share it. What a fantastic collaboration. And I, I love that it's so multifaceted with music and poetry and meditation instruction, I presume. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah. I think what you're seeing is the result of me really not wanting to compromise, like letting any part of my life go. I just I just love all this stuff so much. It's like I don't want to live a life that's not in touch with music. I don't want to live a life that's not in touch with meditation. Like I'm like helplessly nerdy, clearly. So I can't, <laughs> I can't escape from wanting to do schoolwork. Like, so yeah, I know. I just, I just like these things like won't let me go, and I don't want to let them go. And so this is also the result of just me being unwilling <laughs> to to yield in some ways. Um, so, but having a having a good time sometimes obviously stressful, but um, but yeah, I held a lot of gratitude and a lot of appreciation. So that's great. It's such a unique dissertation. I love it. It sounds like such a fun thing to work on. Yeah, no, it's been it's been really cool. So yeah, hoping to wrap up like the pilot test. The pilot tests are going to be what the dissertation is, and dissertations at Harvard consists of three can consist of three individual studies. So I've conducted two of the studies thus far. Working on the third pilot test now, which so hopefully yeah, dissertation will be done soon, and they can again just let this let this do what it's meant to do. And do you anticipate once it's publicly available, will you try to do any larger scale? research having you know so many more people possibly being able to benefit from it or is it just kind of put it out and be done yeah no definitely hoping to do large-scale research with it i think that's the beauty of you know digital approaches to mental health is that there's just infinite scalability to them um that was also a big draw of the work is like i have a draw to making music that's publicly available and also has the, the added benefit of being able to reach thousands millions you know possibly and also the again the exciting thing is there's so much to investigate about how music moves us, how black music specifically moves us, how it heals us. And it's this force that has existed at the bedrock of American culture, um, American popular culture, and has been a clear driving engine for black resilience for centuries, for black flourishing for centuries. And yet, when you look at the scientific literature, psychological literature about it as a force for, for healing, it's so thin, um, if not completely non-existent within some domains of psychology. So... Um, so yeah, for me, it just feels like there's this wide open uh, plane for exploring and playing and collaborating and, and making. I just, um, yeah, it's it's very exciting. So long way of saying, yes, I absolutely hope to, and the current plan that I have is to pair the release um, with an investigation around how music streaming platforms can, can be used to support Black mental health. So Yeah, yeah. awesome. I was going to ask you too, a little bit about what's known about music therapy or the role of music in healing. And I appreciate they just brought up that black music in particular is not studied very much at all in this domain. So um, what do we know and, and maybe where are places to expand? Sure. Yeah. So I want to contextualize my knowledge that because I'm rooted within the field of psychology, there might be a lot that I'm missing about research that's already done. So I don't want to, you know, erase any efforts that have been made within this domain. And I think simultaneously from my own work of needing to have a foothold within music medicine and also really quick back context. Technically, 
the field I'm in is music medicine, which relates to pre-recorded music being used to support with healing and music therapy is actually a very specific discipline around folks who are trained within that discipline to directly administer like live musical care oh, to okay. other people. Yeah. So that's also a distinction that I've had to come into because um, the two are actually quite different just because, again, music therapy, there's a licensure process. There's a, there's a that's like a whole lineage that I'm actually not tuned into. OK. Thanks for clarifying. For sure, yeah. It's it's a clarification that I have to like re-remind myself all the time. Um, and simultaneously, I think what's true across literally all clinical care, which is why, again, even though I'm not firmly, again, within a music medicine program, it's very clear that Black music has been profoundly understudied. And again, in my investigations, in my literature reviews, literature searches, I could find a handful of articles at best that address you know, black music as a, as a vehicle for healing. And when you look at those articles, what I can really say is that a lot of the, at least the, the quote unquote standards of rigor that get applied within Western psychology, which really does serve as a, a benchmark for what it means for something to meet the standard of, of efficacy for care within our current care networks. Very few studies, if any, really rise to that quote unquote benchmark that we set. And it's not that there's, again, anything that is inherently good or bad about those benchmarks. It's just that we, within our current cultural context, we set certain parameters around what qualifies something to count as healing versus not. In very few investigations, again, to my knowledge, no investigations have really been rigorously tested at the level, say, that the NIH would require to really have it be validated as an empirically supported um, mental health intervention. Yeah, and I'm guessing, I'm just assuming, is that lack of studying Black music also related to a lack of studying Black populations in which to help? Period. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I mean, it, it's such a clear result of white supremacy, frankly. <laughs> just just yeah. to go straight there. It's such a, because it's another reflection of all the treatment disparities that are talked about all the time. Right. Music in healing and music and survival within the black community is like one of the clearest elements of our own survival that we know of. I mean, when you think about like enslavement, slavery, like what got enslaved people through was was music so often. And and so you think you see this, you know, this massive part of the black experience not being investigated in any really systematic way in the same way that you see so many other treatments being investigated. And for me, it really does. Yeah, it's clearly, a, you know, a, a result of, you know, structural inequity. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, your work in itself, just forming this research and this particular intervention is also a kind of activism pushing back. I think so. Yeah. I'm going to borrow a framework from Adrian Marie Brown. But, yeah, it feels like a form of pleasure activism. And I'm borrowing the framework, but I think the real truth of it is I'm just honestly having a really good time. <laughs> yeah. Which I think, like, pleasure activism at the heart of it is really genuinely having a good time and how disruptive that is and how, like, unsettling that is because... When you're having a good time, like the amount of energy that flows and the ways in which it actually outcomes and like the ways you're measured and the ways that, you know, the structures that be used to kind of evaluate and couch and box in, a lot of that falls away. And not to say that it's not going to mean that I'm not in relationship to those things. Like, obviously, you know, I'm practicing Western science, which in some ways, paradoxically, is like as like empirical and measured as it gets. But that is just my truth. That's my truth. Like, that's actually... It turns out that like one of the most structured, stringent ways that you can measure things um, happens to be a way that I experience a lot of freedom. And that's just like, again, a paradox that is just true of my experience. Um, and I think everyone has their own paradoxical way of existing within this world of making it through. And mine is just like, yeah, having ultimately just having a good time. Um, and that is a form of activism for me because there's a lot of ways to not be happy in graduate school. And I, not to say <laughs> I've always been happy. I've had some very difficult times, so it's not to say that, but... I'm also having a great time. Like, I'm surrounded yeah. by people I love. I'm doing work that I, like, I love with my whole spirit. Like, that really is a, a deep form of freedom to me. I appreciate you raising that dichotomy between, you know, being embedded in Western science, which is, I feel it in my body as a kind of very patriarchal system, so reductionist and um, 
and then also, you know, bringing in this side that is fully open. And I love that synthesis. And I'm just wondering if you want to reflect on your experience in academia, which is also, you know, a massive expression of those energies. For sure. I mean, again, like how much time do you have for real? (laughs) Because, I mean, there's so much to say. I'll start by saying I feel profoundly blessed. Like that's the first and foremost. Like I do want to start with the blessings because all the bad stuff, all the forces, you know, patriarchy, supremacy, you know, all the things that motivate so much of um, this contemplative work, this healing work. I've experienced all of it. You know what I mean? It's 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 almost, and I think we all do, actually, regardless. I think that's the thing is actually, like, no matter your identities, like, we're actually all in relationship with these forces, period. And I think they hurt all of us, genuinely, which is, um, again, a, a conversation and a topic that can come up maybe later on. But long way of saying, just to start us off. Yeah, I've encountered a lot of the bad of academia, for sure. That has definitely found me. And I also think, again, I think for me, the reason why I started with blessings is because I can't talk about the bad of my experience without talking about, like, so many of the clear blessings. The blessing that I found in my advisor, Dr. Matthew Nock. I I love that man. He's a very, he's such a, he's such a special person. He's such a, he's such a good person. Um, and beyond him being a good person, he's such a profoundly special mentor, like, before him, I had literally no interest in going into academia at all. I had no, even though I know that's weird because I'm in a PhD, but I mostly, frankly, was motivated to do the PhD um, because I really wanted um, a clinical license because, again, what motivated me to come to PhD was the fact that I was holding healing space um, in Boston for folks of color, contemplative space, and that was what I was planning to do. And, you know, a PhD was one way to really resource that. And I like school, like I said. So for me, the plan was like, do school, Learn a bit, for sure, but really was trying to focus on that direct care work. But Matt totally put me on to like an entire new way of relating to my work, to my path. Not from a place of any pressure. He was like, literally do whatever you want. And he was like, and I think that this could really work for you. And it could be a way, frankly, to just like resource your ideas, like your deepest desires. And that really is academia at its best. So like, check it out if you want. No pressure at all. He really never put any pressure on me, but one thing got to another and he really showed me that academia really at its best is a way for one for me to do the things that I care about most within a resourced framework um so that's the blessing in the form of my academic advisor and Matthew Nock like I I will never will never ever not talk about it's just such a such an amazing thing and then it's also again like the academy has also just introduced me to like so many special people I think that's the thing about Harvard it's like there's such a wildly paradoxical place because like it definitely like you know in this cultural context is like such a symbol of just so many like hierarchical things Uh, such a such a clear symbol of so many structural hierarchies that i think you know in this current cultural moment we're investigating and looking twice and askance at and again i think the thing about harvard as well simultaneously is like i have time and time again continued to meet like some of the most incredible sacred people that I've ever met in my life. And that's also, I also can't look away from that part of my experience. Like truly chosen family, like some of the members of like um, my program that I just, are, that are just like really chosen family to me. Um, I met Esperanza. She was my teacher in my class. Amazing. I literally, I took a class that wanted to learn how to write songs and multiple years later, we're writing a song together, like literally writing a song together. Like it's stuff out of an actual fairy tale. Like for me, it's like, fairy tale level energy that I got invited into through the academies. And that's like what, I don't know, the Dharma is for me is about. It's like, okay, yeah, obviously there's all this bad stuff. But yeah, you can't look away from that either. Again, that's for another podcast. But also, man, the blessings that have that have come in this past few years of my life have been overwhelming, overwhelming blessings. And so for me, I, I, I do hope, you know, navigating through the academy, I can emphasize more the blessings, less of the... Less of the hierarchical energy is what what I will say as uh, gently as I can <laughs> on this on this podcast. Yeah, you mentioned your activism work in Boston within the Black community, and you know just helping people and your interest in healing and original interest in clinical work there. So, um, do you want to share a little bit more about that group and that yeah, work? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the Black Lotus Collective. Like, wow, that's really the group that has. Yeah, I don't know. I I mean, what a sacred, meaningful... All these words are, like, super reductive. Like, literally, when I think about switch points, decision points over the course of my life, the Black Lotus Collective truly 
has defined my entire life path going forward. It's really like that that serious uh, a life development for me. So I do want to say the group started when I met collaborator Juliana Santoyo at a um, meditation retreat in California. And we both happen to be from Boston. And we both just like were thinking about love in similar ways, wondering how do we like resource ourselves and care into the far future. We were much younger than um, I was in my early to mid 20s, um, 31 now. And we were just thinking about asking questions in a similar way. And so we got to Boston, got to vibing. And then one thing led to another. It was like, you want to just start a collective right here, right now? <laughs> and so, <laughs> and then magically at the same time that we were on retreat, they introduced um, Radical Dharma to me. And just like, because I had never heard about Radical Dharma, which um, again, spoiler alert, written by Lama Rod, um, Andrew Kyoto Williams, um, Jasmine Sidula, all about race, meditation, dharma, practice. Um, and then at the two week stretch that we happened to be there, we didn't even know this at the time, but Andrew Kyoto Williams happened to be speaking at Green Gulch at the time. And then we got back to Boston and then Lama Rod was speaking like oh, two weeks after that. And then we, and then like we were, cause we, I don't know, just like a young 20 year old. I was like with Huli and we were there and we we're like, Hey, we want to start a meditation community. And Lama Rod was like, so do I, we should talk. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. And then, so then Lama Rod brought folks in um, that we worked with as well. One thing led to another. And then we were just like holding meditation space. And before when we started um, just to honor our roots, we were the radical Dharma Sangha of Boston. So we were explicitly within the radical Dharma lineage. Since then, we've spun off Nothing But Love with Rod. Obviously, we still work together. And it's just like we were very clearly like just starting to do our own thing more so. And so it just made sense to um, call ourselves something different. And then so well, now we call ourselves the Black Lotus Collective. And it's been like six years going on seven that we've been holding uh, meditation space. And so now we hold monthly sits. Um, have been doing on Zoom since the pandemic. And yeah, life changing. That's great. And is that specifically for BIPOC folks? Yeah, it's for BIPOC folks, um, queer folks, disabled folks. Yeah, really anyone who um, has an identity that, you know, historically hasn't been honored to the depth that it, that it should be. I know some of your more recent work is looking at psychedelics in psychology, and that's, you know, having a, a resurgence of interest um, in the field and around contemplation as well. So would love to hear what you've been up to in that space. Yeah, no, I'd love to talk about it. So, um, yeah, psychedelics is a huge part of my research program. Actually, um, in terms of all the papers that I have published thus far in graduate school, all of them have actually been about psychedelics. So that's a huge part of my um, research program. So just for some background, like at the same time that I was like publishing in psychedelic work, I was like developing the intervention because I knew that the intervention would take a lot longer to develop and test. And so at the simultaneously, I was just like working on um, publishing in psychedelics because um, I came across like a research pathway that um, really started to work for me um, in that domain. So... Yeah, what got you interested in the psychedelic path? Yeah, psychedelics and meditation for me feel like so inextricably intertwined. Um, just in a formal way, so many of the mechanisms of action of psychedelics and meditation, um, there's so much overlap um, just in terms of worldview expansion, being in touch with something larger than yourself, a feeling of like rootedness and groundedness, um, profound world expanding experiences, so much overlap um, between dharmic path and, and psychedelics that have that's increasingly being explored within within Western science. So for me the two the two as, you know, um companion research arms has always felt very natural. Um and so it's kind of been the thing that's really led me to investigate it. And it's also been something that that also just flowed naturally. I, I love studying them. I think there's there's immense potential within psychedelics. I also think one of the reasons why I feel uh, grateful to be able to study them is because Frankly, I think there's also immense potential for harm. I also think that that's been coming up as well, particularly when we think about um, how psychedelics are going to be applied to underserved populations. And when we think about what does it mean to implement psychedelic treatments within um, Western medical paradigms and Western um, scientific paradigms, which we've already just discussed, definitely come with their own, a lot of baggage, a lot of baggage. Um, and so for me, I also, it felt important to research psychedelics and to have a voice within that field because... Already, when you think about kind of who's investigating psychedelics, it's um, it's a white dominated field yet again. And I think with that, with that homogeneity comes, you know, blind spots and the potential for harm. And so for me, as much potential as psychedelics have 
like any technologies, there's potential for harm. And I also want to be able to speak to that and speak to the particular needs that folks of color might have um, when developing these treatments. And so to be clear, I'm not anywhere near having fully a fully fleshed out research uh, program to be able to speak to all of that. But thus far within graduate school, it's felt nice to be able to um, to start to contribute to the conversation and to tee up future research that I can do within this domain. Um, yeah. Yeah. So can you share um, some of the findings that you have found so far around your investigations of psychedelics? And also, I'd love to hear more about some of those blind spots, if you have examples that might play in. Definitely. Yeah. I would love to speak to both. And I think as a graduate student, passionate about psychedelics but not really knowing how to investigate. I think a question that I sat with for years is how would I investigate these treatments? Obviously, I can't administer psychedelics within uh, treatment settings at present. Uh, so for me, the question that I had to sit with for um, a long period of time is, yeah, how do I investigate these things? <laughs> you know, how do, I, how do I even study these? Um, and so what happened was I came across a paper by a researcher named um, Peter Hendricks that was just super inspiring because what it did was it looked at large epidemiological data sets and looked at the associations that psychedelics share on the population level with various mental health outcomes. Um, and so what he did, he took these really large data sets with like 100,000 people and controlled for a bunch of variables and started to see like, even though it's, again, not in a causal framework, it's a statistical approach to say, even when you control for all these things that could be driving a potential effect, psychedelics, even at the population level, you see a very consistent pattern of them being associated with lowered odds of um, of harmful outcomes. In the case of um, the Hendricks et al. paper, that was um, it being associated with lowered odds of psychological distress and suicidality. But what that woke up in me is like, oh, I can do that right now. Like, if that person took this data, which is publicly available, if this person can do this right now, I can also look at that data set, ask my own questions, and start to contribute to this um, field in that way. And so I think what felt special is my advisor helped me to establish you know, a clear um, analytical approach, a clear analytical framework for investigating these substances that also, um, the thing with large data sets is since, since there's so many variables, um, there's, you know, issues that could happen with p-hacking or whatever, where you're changing your analytical approach just to get significant results. So we kind of set up this like a priori analytical framework. It's like, yeah, I'll stick to this. Um, if you get a result, good, write it up. If you don't, then you have to like, just like really hold yourself to account with that. And so again, it was a really great accountability partner as it went about my um, investigations, but it's, it just still turned out the pattern really held across a lot of variables, which is like a really profound thing to see. Um, again, just at, even at the population level, you're consistently seeing psychedelics and psychedelics uniquely conferring lowered odds of um, various markers of addiction, social impairment related to mental health disorders, um, criminal arrests, um, depression, um, suicidality. My advisor and I pu have published about all those outcomes um, mm. just, just based on that analytical um, framework alone. And I think what's exciting about it is that it you know, can tee up future causal investigations into those uh, questions. And while that's all exciting, um, I think what has excited me most about the psychedelic investigations is that um, what I've started to do with that large data set, um, which is definitely feels like a contribution that I, that I feel um, really grateful to be able to make, is I've started to investigate how race and ethnicity might moderate some of those associations. Mm. Um, so um, a common thread that I'm going to continue to bring back, which again is um, sadly um, unsurprising, but when you look at psychedelic research, similar to meditation research and similar to research about black music, you're seeing almost no research about people of color and yeah, just almost no research about what is the impact of psychedelics on mental health in diverse communities. All the treatment research that's conducted thus far has been with majority white samples. Um, which, again, just creates really serious limitations around um, external validity when you think about applying these treatments to communities of color. So what I've done is I've taken a lot of the associations that I've looked at um, thus far and some of the uh, preliminary research that I just told you about, and I've started to test race and ethnicity as a moderator for some of the associations that I named. So essentially, fancy way of saying, how does race and ethnicity impact some of the associations that I found? Um, and does it impact at all in a significant way? There's statistical ways to test whether a given demographic variable significantly will change a particular association. And across a few papers now, some of which are under review, some of which are actually out and published, I've demonstrated not only does race and ethnicity um, indeed significantly impact um, the associations that psychedelics share with mental health outcomes, 
when you look uh, specifically by race and ethnicity, you see a very consistent pattern in which for racial and ethnic minorities, the associations that psychedelics share with harmful mental health outcomes is fewer and weaker. And so what you're actually seeing is that most of the effect is driven by the white people in the sample. Oh, interesting. Yeah, why that's super interesting is because, again, it really follows the exact same pattern that treatment research is following now, where we have this treatment research saying, okay, psychedelics um, impact mental health um, positively for people. And, you know, we have these, these clinical trials that show like, hey, psychedelics are great. And it's not to knock those trials, but it is just to say, um, and again, my research is done within a um, correlational context, so I can't make causal claims. Right. But it does raise similar questions around if you aren't looking at these associations for communities of color, what are the blind spots? Is it, do these effects hold when you actually look at them within um, diverse populations? Because when you do that with the correlational research, it actually they don't hold a lot of the time. And so that's actually the question that I've started to ask that I hope that clinical researchers a little bit farther along in their journey can start to ask some of those questions as well, because um, I think they're important. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. So yeah, just to clarify. So, um, cause we're talking a lot about associations and causality and things. So just in case listeners aren't familiar. So is what you're saying that these large data sets, which have mostly been done in white populations have overall found these associations between psychedelic use and less risk of these negative outcomes. Yeah. But when you look at people of color within that sample, those associations aren't necessarily aren't there. That's exactly right. And yeah, as you mentioned, you can't say that uh, the psychedelics are causing the, the benefit per se. But if they are, that might not be happening in communities of color based on this data. So that is really it has really significant implications for clinical practice. I think so too. Yeah. And that's exactly right. So pretty much like just to, yeah, just for me to re-explain it, I looked at a large data set. It's not a treatment data set. It's just like people existing in the world. I demonstrated that psychedelics yeah, are linked to lowered odds of various bad things like uh, depression, anxiety, et cetera. That's for the overall sample. But then when you start to like really stratify and look specifically by race and ethnicity, the associations don't always hold when you look at that for communities of color, which, like you said, if that if that pattern applies to treatment research, then a lot of the findings that we've had thus far within psychedelic trials might not apply to communities of color, which has really important implications, particularly given the fervor and the excitement around psychedelics right now. It's such a you know hot field, and, and a lot of folks are saying these are the most amazing things ever, which, again, I think just has to be held with a lot of um, caution and just with a critical eye. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. And you mentioned that um, that data set wasn't treatment. So it was just people self-reporting, I assume, whether or not they had used psychedelics. Yep, exactly. So that also raises for me just, and I'm totally just, you know, spitballing here. But um, I think that a lot of the work around psychedelics relates to people's trauma and the ways that, that psychedelics can help people approach their trauma and deal with their trauma. And it's done currently in the United States in a very controlled settings. Yeah. You know, as you said, you can't just administer these to people. It's like clinicians have to be trained and kind of help people along their journeys and things like that. So it'd be so interesting to see in a clinical setting if with appropriate contextualization and holding of trauma, whether it could be like, if it's just a population sample, there's different levels or different types of trauma that communities of color would have than, than white communities. Definitely, yeah. Which, in the absence of any clinical context, may not have been held. So it's just interesting to think about. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I totally feel what you're saying. And just to like kind of reflect some of that back and also um, discuss, and my research at least thus far, how I've talked about it. So one of the things psychedelics definitely have been used for is to address trauma. Um, it's been used, I think, generally also just to address like various forms of what we call psychopathology, so depressed mood states, um, depression, um, severe anxiety. And within the population-based data that I analyzed, people are just generally reporting their health. So it's not like people are reporting like, hey, I did psychedelics and I have this thing happen to me. It's just you're getting hundreds of thousands of people who are just, just providing their health data generally. And so it's looking at really large scale associations between who's taking these substances and what they're linked to when you look at just like a bunch of people who are just reporting various demographic factors and substance use um, profiles um, based on you know them living their lives. But something that I think you mentioned 
about what might be happening with people of color in psychedelics, I think, um, kind of gets to the crux of what I'm interested in in this work is communities of color absolutely have specific forms of trauma that I do think with the right holding context could absolutely be healed and supported by psychedelic substances. And, you know, when you look at indigenous communities, which, again, have to acknowledge that so many plant-based medicines have millennia long lineages within indigenous communities for healing, for spiritual practice, and many indigenous communities around the world, um, that is a true fact for. Simultaneously though, I think there's also kind of a concept that exists within psychedelics, that's this term set and setting, which is the mindset that you head into a psychedelic experience with, as well as the setting in which you do psychedelics, radically changes the impact of the psychedelic substance. And when you think about, you know, folks of color doing psychedelics within the American context in a non-held environment, there's a lot of trauma just in the air within America, being a person of color. There's a, and also these substances are extremely illegal, extremely illegal still, um, even though they're, again, all within the medical context, they have, you know, some immunity. But doing these substances as a lay person on the street opens you up to massive danger from the state, massive opportunity to be harmed and to have your life destroyed in very clear ways. And when you see, again, particularly the black community, millions of people's lives have been destroyed because of um, the ways that the state has reacted to their substance use. Right. And so for me, when I when I've been hypothesizing about why, you know, I'm not seeing some of the associations between psychedelics and um, lowered odds of, you know, bad outcomes within communities of color, I think about that fact, the fact that Communities of color doing these substances in the unheld American context actually could be maybe stoking, you know, some of this harm, could be stoking some of the less positive elements of the psychedelic experience. Um, right. Um, again, I don't have data to support that, but it definitely has at least led me to the point of wanting to ask the question. I definitely hope to investigate it in, in future research. I'm curious if you see parallels, you know, you mentioned parallels between psychedelics and meditation and contemplative practice in the sense of kind of world opening or moving beyond the self. I'm wondering if you see parallels also with music, your other work. Is is there a similar action there? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I think before I even knew what like a contemplative practice was, um, before I even had that language, like music just like was that. It was it's just such a self-evident form of transcendence, of healing, of, um, of understanding. Um, and I think that that is just music kind of inherently. It's such a mysterious force that we as humans get to interact with. We get, we get to make notes and have them translate a certain form of meaning that somehow transcends all language, all culture, all time, just as a part of the human experience. It's like actually, again, when you really unpack that, it's like, oh, it's pure magic. It yeah. really is. Music is pure magic and I think we haven't even started to really even though there's a again a lot of lineages um, that that have uh, scientific lineages that have investigated music in very serious ways for healing I also simultaneously don't think that we've scratched the surface because again when you think about the sheer underrepresentation of black musical art forms within clinical research um, that for me alone sheds light on how deeply underinvestigated music is as a healing force and that's just the black community it's not even all the rest of the communities of color that within western scientific research haven't been given their time to really investigate these as 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 treatments so yeah there's it's when you really start to see like the there's just these wide open um domains of of investigation that uh that i think exists there so for pure magic again pure magic yeah i love it um, I'm just curious, like in the realm of all of these forms that you have been immersed in music and contemplation and psychedelic work, and to the extent that they all kind of move us outside of a small self or a restricted self kind of, which is such a huge part of, of meditation, right? And, and those paths. I'm wondering how you hold that and like that trajectory of moving beyond the self also with the role of identity and the importance of identity f for you as a person. Yeah. Ooh, these questions, these questions, we love. I, what a what a beautiful, what a profound question. Um, I think I approach this question in the same way that I approach a lot of um, how I approach my work is not trying to be too serious about it. 
I think earlier on in my in my meditation practice, I think a lot of people go through this where it's like I have to learn the forms and I have to sit and I have to sit for 30 minutes. And if I sit for 30 minutes, then that's how I will transcend my ego. Once I've transcended my ego, then I will be able to understand the relationship between identity and structure and also non-structure. I can really sit in that non-do space. And I think like as you, as I have gone throughout my meditation practice, I've really, again, A, started to see how personal it is. B, for me, the paradox of my practice, which I will say has a certain amount of depth at this point being, you know, at least a decade and some people are multiple decades. I, you know, at least have a little bit over a decade of practice. Um, I think something started to happen to me where it's like, oh, actually, like, I get to like not be so serious about this. You know what I mean? Like I get <laughs> yeah. to, I get to be, again, going back to beginner's mind, I get to just investigate. I get to make it empirical for me. I get to test it out and try it. And like maybe something that I do will not work. Maybe, maybe I'll make a song. Maybe I make this intervention. Didn't know if it would resonate or not. Like maybe I thought that in, you know, centering identity as a form of inviting people to go beyond there. So maybe I would play this intervention for folks and people like, I hate it. Do it. Start over. You know what I mean? Like it's <laughs> true. I really was going on blind faith. I was going, again, going on the blind faith of just like, I love this. It makes me feel like I've transcended my small self. Maybe we'll further be, I hope it does. You know, I I've, I've, I have a certain depth of practice at this point. I have people who like, Definitely have more practice. Like Lama Ra, like, you know, he did that whole three-year situation, that three-year side. So it's like, he, he he definitely knows at least a little bit more than me. So if I don't know, then he definitely knows something. So I ran it by him. I asked him. Um, again, bless a musical mentor, Esperanza Falling. She has multiple, randomly has like thousands of lifetimes of musical experience and is like in her late 30s. I don't get that. Again, just... Again, reality doesn't really make sense. And I think that's another. So it's just like, <laughs> if it makes sense to me, I think I just like reasonably ask the question for people that definitely have more experience than me. And they're like, that sounds about right. And then I go ask the people for whom I'm trying to do the thing for. And like, hey, that actually, that worked out great. And I was like, okay, cool. So that for me is science in a nutshell. I think that's the thing also about hierarchy that we talked about. Like hierarchy has a way of making things so unfun and so like unnecessarily serious. Like... And again, I do think what needs to be serious is like not harming people when people t are telling you like that they're being harmed. Like take that seriously. Like that's like, okay, like that's really something to like really sit with and like be with. And that I take seriously. But also I feel like if you're taking having a good time seriously, you ask these questions in earnest. To be clear, I obviously did want, I'm not going to pretend like I didn't want a certain outcome. Like it would have been really sad to like work on this for years and then be like, I hate it. That would have been really sad. But also like, that would have been okay. You know what I mean? Just like, it would have been okay. So I think I just remembering that, like, I get to be curious. I get to take it one building block at a time. That for me, like we talked about in terms of like, what are the limitations of Western science, but what is like the invitation? I think that for me really is like the gift of Western science that I found for me is like, it's a way to document my process and just like ask questions with the language that does have sway in our culture. That also just happens to be like something that is what it is. We happen to live in a time in which like Western science is taken really seriously. So I get to be curious, I get to ask questions, I get to do it with a language that also um, has currency. And that for me is how I do it, just one step at a time. Well, that's awesome. Um, anything that we haven't touched on as we're closing that you wanted to share or take home messages? No, just thank you for this opportunity. Just, um, no, I'm just grateful. Hope to continue just doing what I'm doing, honestly. I'm just Yeah, just grateful for all the people who supported me to this point in my journey. I'm so, I feel so blessed and i just hope to be able to continue to have a good time make music spend time loving people i love that's it for me that's that's call it a day <laughs> yeah well i love the way that you are synthesizing you know all these interests and the way that you show up um it, it does propagate healing in the world and uh, thank you yeah I'm really very appreciate grateful you, so. i appreciate you too no thank you so much for this opportunity Thank you for taking time to, yeah. to chat with us today and be on the show. Absolutely. Blessings. This episode was edited and produced by me and Phil Walker. And music on the show is from Blue Dot Sessions and Universal. Show notes and resources for this and other episodes can be found at podcast.mindandlife.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share it with a friend. And if something in this conversation sparked insight for you, let us know. You can send an email or voice memo to podcast at mindandlife.org. Mind and Life is a production of the Mind and Life Institute. Visit us at mindandlife.org 
where you can learn more about how we bridge science and contemplative wisdom to foster insight and inspire action towards flourishing. If you value these conversations, please consider supporting the show. You can make a donation at mindandlife.org under support. Any amount is so appreciated and it really helps us create this show. Thank you for listening.